Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Teresa Runyon, and I am from Padre Star Parish. I serve there as the Faith Life Minister, and uh, I'll be your host this evening. Just a, a couple of housekeeping items. As we all know, uh, chat, you know, um, excuse me, uh, uh, with Zoom, we um, we know how to use the, the mute button. So we're going to use that tonight just so we don't hear uh, any background noise, uh, adorable children or dogs or spouses. Um, just so we can, we can hear uh, Father Patrick clearly, and um, he will take he will take questions all through the presentation. If you could just put those in chat, and then we'll take a break um, every so often and and make our way through those questions that you might have. And um, it's my honor to introduce Father Patrick. He has been our um, pastor. Well, he's been at Padre Sarah's administrator pastor since 2010, coming from the seminary where he was the scripture professor. And he's uh, an author and speaker, uh, going many places around the world, even to speak um, and, and uh, teach on scripture. And he's uh, the third of nine children to a good Catholic family from Holy Family in, <laughs> in Glendale. So I uh, turn it over to you, Father Patrick. All right. Should we start with a prayer? Does that seem right? Uh, uh, Pope Francis has a prayer to St. Joseph that I thought we could that we could do together. So. Uh, uh, let's remember that we're in God's holy presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you, God entrusted his only Son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ grew to be a man. Bless Joseph, to us too, show yourself a father. Guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen? Amen. So, um, what are we going to do tonight? Uh, we're going to do a scriptural take on St. Joseph and uh, try to unpack that for our own mm -hmm. spiritual benefit. Uh, Joseph is on the, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to go ahead and mute so that uh, if you ha happen to say a word or two that we all don't hear you. So uh, go ahead and mute. Thank you for that. Uh, Joseph is only expressly mentioned in three books of the New Testament. So he is a focus some attention in Matthew's gospel and uh, we will focus there. Uh, Joseph, uh, is also mentioned in uh, Luke's gospel. Uh, we'll look at some of those passages. We're going to skip the ones that simply mention Joseph in passing, simply for the sake of time. In John's gospel, Jesus is referred to as Joseph's son in John 1.45. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law and also the prophets, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And then again in, in John 6.42, the Jews murmured, in the uh, bread of life uh, discourse, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his mother and father? Now these two uh, passages from Joseph don't say anything else about Joseph, so uh, we won't spend any time on them. Curiously, Joseph is never mentioned in Mark's gospel, in Acts of the Apostles, or in any of the letters or epistles or sermons or in the book of Revelation. Uh, as we'll see, he was not a primary focus of the New Testament as was his foster son. And we'll see that he'd probably approve of that, all right? So where shall we begin? We'll begin in Matthew. If you happen to have your Bible there, go ahead and open to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, and we're gonna start with uh, Jesus' genealogy at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. And I do say Jesus' genealogy because Matthew's gospel calls it that. Really, it's Joseph's. Uh, but Jesus makes it his own for theological reasons. And we're going to read through this. Uh, we, we could do this on Christmas. Almost no one ever does, but we're going to read through it right here because it uh, uh, puts uh, Joseph and Jesus right there in context. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, in Greek, that's called Biblis Genesios. Genesios, uh, uh, genealogy, is intended to remind us of the uh, 
book of Genesis, because here we are at the beginning of this book of the life of Jesus, the, the, the Genesis, the beginning of things. Biblos, Genesias, Yesu Christu, Huyoth, David, Theu, Abraham. Abraham became the father of Isaac. So right there at the beginning, right at the top, there's a deliberate focus on three people. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. This is going to be a Jewish story right from the start. With Abraham, we have the origins of the people of God. With David, we have the royal house and lineage that ruled in Judah for centuries and from which the Messiah came. So again, Abraham became the father of Isaac there in verse 2. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah became the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Remember that name. Perez became the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Solomon. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Remember that name. Boaz became the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Remember that name. Obed became the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David, the king. David became the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. Uh, you remember the wife of Uriah, whose name is actually Bathsheba. Remember that name. Solomon became the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph. Asaph became the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah became the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah became the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amos. Amos, the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the Babylon exile. Do not despair on me. We're almost to the end. After the Babylonian exile, Jeconiah became the father of Shiltiel. Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud became the father of Eliachim. Eliachim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok became the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar became the father of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Note. There's a pattern. Right at the end, the genealogy breaks the pattern. And this is actually a theological point here. Uh, if, it, if it was going to be following the model, it was supposed to say, Mathen, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, Joseph, the father of Jesus. And it doesn't. Rather, it says Joseph, the father of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Poor Joseph, he gets bumped right there at the critical moment. Uh, Luke is also going to indicate in a genealogy, which we'll get to later, that Joseph is not Jesus' biological father. So both genealogies have two purposes, distinguishing Joseph from any begetting of Jesus, but also connecting Jesus through Joseph to the royal line of David. Uh, how can this be? Well, in Roman law, adoptions were constitutive. That means that the adopted were no longer constitutionally part of their old family, their old house from which they had been taken. They became really part of their new one. So men could adopt sons who were in fact older than they were. Adoption removed all rights and responsibilities from the biological parents and transferred them to the adoptive parents. So why do this? Well, it's actually all about inheritance. And as we'll see, Joseph doesn't have a lot of property and is not the biological father. Uh, what did Jesus have to inherit? other than that one key participation in the royal line from which the Messiah had to come. And God, who was the father, in fact, uh, was content with this arrangement. So enough so that the angel Gabriel in Luke 131 is going to say, behold to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And the only way David is his father is through this adopted relationship that he has with Joseph. So God, the father, through the mouth of Gabriel, his servant, accepts the consequences of Joseph's adoption of Jesus into the Davidic line. Now, Paul, who never mentions Joseph, does refer to this relationship to David. In Romans 1.3, he also speaks of Jesus as descended from David according to the flesh, but established as son of God in power. Again, into Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, such is my gospel. So there you have it. Uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, 
an adoptive relationship here that constitutively gives Jesus uh, a membership in the royal house of Israel, all through Joseph. Now, uh, let, uh, let's take a moment to go back to those four women who stayed, who set the stage for Joseph's first crisis. Uh, remember the first one in uh, uh, Matthew 1, 3, Tamar? She's jo Judah's daughter-in-law, and Judah wronged her gravely twice, and she ends up seducing him because he does not give one of his sons to her to father a child, which he was obliged to do. <laughs> anyway, read all about it in Genesis 38. Uh, it's an incredibly interesting story, um, but <laughs> also kind of interesting. Uh, then we've got Rahab the prostitute who saved the Israelite spies when they were scouting out the promised land in Joshua 2 and 6. Uh, so we've got a prostitute and we've got Ruth, the Moabite. She's a foreigner. She doesn't belong. Read all about that in the book of Ruth. Then we've got Bathsheba, the one the, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. The question everyone wants to know is what was she doing bathing on the roof inside of the light in light, line of sight of the palace? Um, she's probably, as uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, a foreigner also, her name Bathsheba, daughter of Sheba, also suggests that. So we've got these four women, only, the, only four women mentioned in the genealogy, and they're all a little out of step with propriety, and yet included when the well-reared and the behaved grandmothers are not. Mind you, they're King David's ancestors also. So what is the purpose of putting these women in the gospel and highlighting them in this way? What was Matthew thinking? Well, it makes room for the Gentile. And eventually Gentiles are gonna to wanna to be part of this thing. It makes room for the scandalous. And I don't know if your life is scandalous enough, but there's room for you if you're scandalous. It makes room for God's ability to work with what other people might consider unsalvageable, but God's going to work with them. And it also makes room for God's work through women, which would perhaps be obvious in our day, but might not have been in the day when Matthew was writing. And truly, it makes room for Jesus' own irregular conception and birth, which we'll see shortly was a concern for poor, poor Joseph. So going back to the genealogy there in verse 17, thus the total number of generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. From David to the Babylonian exile, 14 generations. From Babylonian exile to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now notice that Joseph and his theologically important lineage for the coming Messiah arise at just the right moment so that Jesus could be the ultimate 14th offspring. Abraham to David is 14. Solomon to Jeconiah is 14. Jeconiah to Jesus, the Messiah, is 14 generations. Uh, so there, Joseph comes along at just the right moment for Jesus to fulfill this pattern. Th this genealogy and the one in Luke are not meant to be historical. On the contrary, they're making theological points. And so the gospel writers make interesting, interesting decisions about who to include. Only two titles are provided by Matthew in this genealogy. David the king, in Greek, Tan Basileia, back in verse 6. And Jesus, who is referred to as the Messiah, spelt out in Greek uh, in verse 17. So among the things to note from the perspective of Joseph, it's actually his lineage. So Joseph is a descendant of the royal line. But the details aren't given us so that we can celebrate Joseph's descendants from David. In some ways, Joseph is just a prop here. It's all about Jesus and to a lesser extent, Mary. As we continue into in the next episode, we're, uh, we'll see that trend continue. And we're also going to see that Joseph too acts as though it's all about Jesus and not about him. So for our spiritual consideration, Joseph actually has something to give to Jesus his lineage, that is his identity. And this identity gives Jesus his proper role as Messiah. In that role, Jesus does something similar as he saves us. He shares his identity with us. We too become God's beloved daughters and sons. So it's worth considering. Does your lineage, does your identity have any way of serving God? I mean, jo Joseph's situation poses this for us. As Americans, we're, we're big on doing. It's part of why we have prospered as much as we have. Uh, but we're a little bit weak on the just being. Joseph's first gift to us is to consider how very con 
uh, that very content that we simply brought the person we are to God in prayer of presence. Just being in God's presence might be enough. Um, it's not all about it's not all about doing. Joseph will be about doing. We'll see that, but it's not all about that. Sometimes it's just about being. So uh, we have some uh, something noteworthy to observe in uh, uh, Matthew here. There are two annunciations in Luke. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and not Joseph. In Matthew, an unnamed angel addresses Joseph in dreams. And it's through his perspective that we're going to be looking. So in Matthew 1.18, we're, we're back to uh, uh, Matthew's gospel in 1.18. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, now note this, since he was a righteous man, Yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. So right there, we have a biblical evaluation of Joseph's character. The narrator, and we have no reason to doubt the narrator as reliable, calls Joseph a righteous man in verse 19. This is only going to happen a few times. In Luke 2350, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea is described by the narrator as a virtuous and righteous man. And Acts 11.21 says of Barnabas, who also bore the name Joseph, for he was a good man. It's curious to me that these three different Josephs are all standouts for having the narrator identify their characters in this way. In each case, if we look carefully, each of them are going to be judged not for their words, but for the lovely coming together of their inner life and outer action. For our spiritual consideration, for our reflection, if by chance, consider this, a narrator of the gospel were to speak about your character or mine, how might the gospel narrator describe us, describe you or me? It's worth considering. All right. Um, so we come into a dilemma for, for Joseph here. In the last passage, we learn of Joseph's inner life and his intentions through the narrative that he's the kind of man that doesn't want to expose the woman he's engaged to, but is pregnant, and he had nothing to do with it, to shame. Now, this is an extraordinary man. Under the circumstances, what was Joseph supposed to have done when he discovered that Mary was pregnant? Regarding a bride accused of infidelity, Deuteronomy 22.20 20 says... If evidence of the young woman's virginity is not found, they shall bring the young woman to the entrance of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death because she committed a shameful crime in Israel by prostituting herself in her father's house. Thus shall you purge the evil from your midst. <laughs> so that was what the law provided. Did the Romans who governed here permit this? Uh, probably not. Uh, why stoning? It keeps the one being killed uh, at a distance and keeps, preserves people's purity. But, Jesus, but Joseph doesn't want Mary stoned. He doesn't even want her exposed to shame. So he decides to divorce her quietly. Uh, we'll look for just a second here at divorce. It was a, a kind of a hotly contested issue among first century Jews. As we can see from a text from the Mishnah, it's composed in about 200 AD, so well after the time of Jesus, but it contains teachings from people who were alive while Jesus was alive. Mishnah Gitim chapter 9 verse 10 says, the house of Shammai says, a man should divorce his wife only because he has found grounds for it in unchastity, since it is said, because he has found in her indecency in anything, quoting Deuteronomy 24. And the house of Hillel says, even if she spoiled his dish, since it is said because he is found in her indecency in anything. Rabbi, Rabbi Akiba says, even if he has found someone else prettier than she, since it is said, and it shall be if she finds no favor in his eyes. So <laughs> here is Joseph. In divorcing Mary quietly, he chose to allow the appearance of having conceived Joseph, Jesus, but perhaps because she spoiled the soup, or perhaps because he has found someone more favorable, he's divorcing her. Basically, he's going to give Mary a get, the Jewish divorce decree ending their engagement. All it took was a piece of paper saying, I divorce you. This would have left everyone with the impression that the child was his, but that Mary had lost favor with Joseph. That was his intent, to save her from shame. 
All right. So verse 20 from Matthew, such was his intention when behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now stop right there. Think back to the Hebrew Bible and consider if you can recall any other Joseph dreaming. Remember Genesis 37, five, once Joseph, the son of Jacob, had a dream. And when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were binding sheaves in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose to an upright position and your sheaves formed a ring around my sheaf and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, are you really going to make yourself king over us? Will you rule over us? So they hated him all the more because of his dreams and his reports. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. This guy could not shut up. Look, I had another dream, he said. This time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told it to his father and his brothers, his father reproved him and asked, what is the meaning of this dream of yours? Can it be that I and your mother and your brothers are to come and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were furious at him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So recall then what happens because of these dreams. Joseph is despised by his brothers. They sell him into slavery. He's brought to Egypt, where he will actually flourish and become powerful. His presence there in a time of terrible drought means that he can save his brothers who despised him and all of his father's family. This Joseph is going to go on in Genesis chapters 40 and 41 to be quite a renowned interpreter of dreams for Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker and then for Pharaoh himself. So in these next two passages, let's be looking for where Joseph, the husband of Mary, will be led by his dream. So back to Matthew, verse 20. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, I hear it is, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. Now, note here again, as in Luke, we have an angel crediting Joseph for being of the royal line. So if you have any questions on the subject, the narrator of the gospel does not. Uh, the, uh, if, I'm not, not sure if you're reading the New American Bible revised. It's a little interpretive here. Uh, a literal translation would say, do not be afraid to take Mary to yourself. This phrase implies taking her to, into his home. And that act, taking a woman into your home, at this point in history, was the marriage rite. It appears that the groom would go with his friends to the father's the bride's father's house with the bride parts, the goats or the cows, whatever had been arranged. The act of bringing his bride into his home or the home of his father was in fact the wedding. It was simply that transfer from the father's house to the house of the groom or perhaps the groom's father's house. The grammatical way the text structures the two instructions, do not be afraid and you shall name him say something, and it's, this is a very subtle thing, but they say something about Joseph's nature. Greek has some beautiful nuances in it. There is an imperative, and it's quite forceful, and you are aware of it. Every time at liturgy you've heard Kyrie uh, eleison, that's actually the imperative. Lord, have mercy. The thing that you do, do it now because we need it. It's, it's, it's said in complete trust that God is going to do this thing, and it's command. Now, it's not used here. In either instruction, uh, there is in Greek what's called a hortatory subjunctive used in uh, the do not be afraid. It presumes that encouragement is all that Joseph needs to do something quite extraordinary. And then there is the simple future tense, you will call him. Uh, the use of these two, the, the mood and that future tense assume, it just assumes Joseph's obedience without any force at all. My point is that the angel presumes Joseph's goodwill in taking a woman who is pregnant, but not with his child as his wife. The angel knows this and phrases the message in the softest kinds of encouragements. The angel, of course, is right. <laughs> Joseph is going to do exactly as he's asked. So the angel continues there in verse 20. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus. Uh, and, and you will name him Jesus is what it says in the li literally translated, because he will save his people from their sins. While the instruction comes from an angel, and that kind of gives it a little bit of force, it's recognized that Joseph, as adoptive father, has the right of naming. The name in Hebrew, Yeshua, it's an abbreviated form of the name Joshua or Yehoshua, 
literally means salvation in, in, in Hebrew. So back to verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. <laughs> There's a lot that could be said about that last verse. It's a quote from Isaiah 7, 14. We're not going to go there. We're staying focused on Joseph. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. Literally, he took her to himself, again, implying marriage. Uh, now, I'm going to say that this must have been one convincing dream. The text doesn't suggest any hesitation on Joseph's part. No self-doubt, no questioning, no bargaining with God, no interrogation of Mary. He awakes and obeys. Do you take life advice from dreams? <laughs> My dreams are too dopey. They're nonsensical. I don't follow them. Uh, perhaps I'm not paying close enough attention. That might be it. But Joseph is sensitive enough to know when he's being addressed by an angel. So Joseph is more than just a man with good ancestry, a good bloodline of the house of David. Joseph is a man so sensitive to the truly holy that he knows when angels are speaking to him in dreams. He's a man with such a relationship with God that when angels ask the improbable from him, take a pregnant woman, pregnant from somebody else, as your wife, he complies. Verse 25, he has no relations with her until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. Uh, uh, this passage seems to kind of cause a lot of consternation for people. I'm simply going to say that the Greek original does not mean to imply that Joseph had marital relationships with Mary after Jesus' birth. It uh, seems to be implied by the English. All it wants to say is that Jesus, Joseph did not by any possible physical means beget Jesus. That task was left to the Holy Spirit. However, the Holy Spirit managed it. All right. For our spiritual consideration, I invite you to consider if there isn't an implicit angelic invitation to us, paralleling the message to Joseph. If angels were to speak to you in your dreams, might they offer you a similar message along with Joseph, not to fear? And here I'm talking about fear in general. We'll see that Joseph is incredibly brave and trusting of this angelic, of his angelic intuitions. How confident are we in our own giftedness? Do we live in fear? Hear the angel say to you, do not fear. In this particular sense, Joseph was invited not to fear taking Mary to himself. And I'd like to suggest that you join with Joseph in taking Mary to yourselves too. Joseph is the first person of faith to be drawn into approaching Mary as a way of drawing close to Jesus. He couldn't know how having Mary in his life was going to completely overturn his expectations for himself. We can't know either. But shouldn't our divine connections overturn us as well? If we're to be able, like Joseph, to get past our first negative impressions of people, like he had to get past his first impression of Mary uh, in her pregnancy, if we're going to get past our first negative impressions of any people in general and let them surprise us with a goodness growing within them, Mightn't that be a grace for us? So I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting what goes on here in Joseph's life uh, might be a model for us as well. Uh, moving to Matthew chapter two, verse one, and the visit of the Magi. Uh, Joseph isn't going to be mentioned during the visit, only the child with Mary, his mother. So we're going to skip to one curious line in Matthew two, eight through 11. After their audience, the Magi's audience with the king, King Herod, they set out, and behold, the, the star that they had seen and its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the, entering the what? The house. They saw that the child with Mary, uh, they saw the child with Mary's mother. The wise men entertain oikion, that is house, not stable, not in, oikion doesn't mean in, not with a manger, but the house, which is presumably Joseph's home, not in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem. And yeah, I know the tradition from Luke of the taxation uh, uh, called for by Caesar Augustus and the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem um, is the story that we're aware of. But in Matthew's gospel, there is no mention of taxes or the enrollment or the trip, there's just a house where the Magi find Mary and the baby. Again, 
presumably it's Joseph House in Bethlehem. Now, does this matter? And I'm going to say, yes, it does, because it's going to be an indication of just how far Joseph is going to go later on in this passage. We're going to see that going to Nazareth in this gospel was a considerable sacrifice on Joseph's part, and it was not a going home as it was in Luke's. All right. He's going to leave Bethlehem his home. Now, jumping to Matthew 2.13. When the Magi had departed, behold, here there's the angel again. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Now, I just I want to point out the, the picture on the screen. This is from Caravaggio. And this is the, the flight into Egypt. And you'll notice the poor baby, uh, Jesus is exhausted and Mary is exhausted. And there's Joseph <laughs> holding the sheet music for the angel so that the baby and Mary could be comforted. Um, and Caravaggio who's a very playful, uh, playful painter has the eye of the, of the donkey right there above Joseph's head and to the right just a little bit. Um, uh, he really gets to the heart of what's going on here, I think, and, and his kind of, in Caravaggio's kind of humorous way, in the midst of a terrible story. Um, Herod is going to search for the child, is what the angel says, to destroy him. Now, Herod was as horrible as this passage suggests. Not only did he, as uh, the, uh, the one historian who writes about him, Josephus, uh, uh, writes in an agreement with the New Testament, putting John the Baptist to death. He also executed his wife. Herod executed his wife, Mariamne, whom Herod loved. And he put to death all of his sons. Why? Because he was afraid. He's afraid they were going to try to replace him. Emperor Augustus, who knew Herod personally, was noted as having said that he would rather be Herod's pig than his son. In essence, the pig of a Jew was getting out alive, but the kids were not. So are the, air, are the angel's commands reasonable? Probably not. Let's weigh it realistically. Leave your home, leave your family, your friends, leave your business contacts, your shop, if Joseph had one, go to Egypt where you know no one and have no business contacts, where they speak a different language and where they are known for their xenophobia, that is their, dis, their decided dislike of foreigners whom they are inclined with their ancient culture to look upon as barbarians. How great, what an opportunity. Um, this time the angel uses three imperatives, straight out commands, take the child, flee to Egypt, stay until I tell you. So what does Joseph do? Does he struggle at length? Does he hem and haw? Does he take it up with a local rabbi? Does he whine about the extreme inconvenience? The text says simply, verse 14, Joseph rose, and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Where we don't get confused about the meaning of love, confusing it for a feeling, when it's actually a decision that one's time, one's possessions, one's body, one's efforts, et cetera, whatever we have, are for another's welfare, that that's what actually what love means. I would suggest to you that while it is never expressly stated in the text, Joseph from early on loves that baby that is not his and the mother who bore him. He puts his life on hold for that baby, entirely on hold. Joseph's example invites us to consider where we are with Jesus and to what extent we concretely love Jesus and how far we would put our life on hold for Jesus, challenging us if what we're really doing is fitting Jesus into the few empty spots in the life that's already focused somewhere else. I'm not suggesting that you or I have to go into exile for Jesus, although Christians in the Near East are in fact doing exactly that because of their faith in Jesus, or that you have to stop your life altogether. But we might all consider the manner in which we are living, our lives, our marriages, our friendships, our work and our leisure. How have we worked our relationship with Jesus into the very fabric of that life? Or is he metaphorically left to die in Bethlehem because of our distraction or our lack of zeal? I, I, I don't say these things to uh, engender guilt, uh, but we're receiving an invitation through Joseph's example to reconsider and rededicate, rededicate ourselves in a fashion like his. So, verse 15, Joseph stayed there until the death of Herod, that what the Lord had said through the prophet might be fulfilled out of Egypt, I called my son. 
in that horrific massacre of the infants in Bethlehem, Joseph is not mentioned. So we can skip straight to verse 19, uh, Matthew 2, 19. When Herod had died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. Now I'm gonna point out again that in the ancient history, there was a Joseph son of Jacob who dreamed dreams that got him into trouble and he was sold into Egypt where he saved his people. Again, here is a Joseph dreaming dreams about a terrible trouble who packs up his life to take his adopted son to Egypt and that adopted son will return to Judah to become the savior of his people. Parallels are intriguing and probably deliberately intended by Matthew. Um, a, a little oddity regarding the date of Jesus' birth. Uh, from the writings of the Jewish histori historian Josephus, we can pinpoint the death of Herod the Great to four, uh, the year 4 BC. I know that means that Jesus had to be born some, somewhere between 47 years BC. <laughs> Jesus was born four years before Christ. <laughs> the problem is not here, is not with the scriptures here. The year one is off. Uh, first of all, there's no year zero, so the calendar goes straight from 1 BC straight to 1 AD, and the calendar was created by a monk, Dionysius Exiguus, and we're not sure how, certain how he established the year one. It may have had something to do with counting back the Roman years along the calendaring of the consuls of Rome. We don't know. In any case, he was off, so the year zero is off. The year zero should be four to seven years before what it is. In any case, uh, Matthew 2.21. Joseph rose, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea, that is where Bethlehem is, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go back there. So Matthew's gospel is indicating here a second time. Joseph's home was in Bethlehem. Uh, at least in Matthew's gospel. In the narrative, in this narrative, that's what's true. And that, and Luke's narrative, his home was Nazareth. But in Matthew's, the home was in Bethlehem. And this matters. Uh, Joseph was afraid to go back there, not for his own sake. Because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee. He went and dwelt in a town, not his home. <laughs> he went and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been written, spoken, excuse me, through the prophets might be fulfilled, that he shall be called a Nazarene. So, again, Luke's gospel recounts a tax that brought Joseph from his home in Nazareth to be registered in Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in a place where animals were stabled. And then states in Luke 2.39, when they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, Joseph and Mary returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Matthew's gospel doesn't mention the tax nor the journey and includes the story of the Magi who visit the family in Bethlehem, not in an inn, but in the house, as we pointed out earlier. Uh, so Joseph's home, in this gospel at least, was in Bethlehem. And the reason for going to Nazareth was not to go home, but to keep the baby Jesus away from Herod the Great's incompetent son, Herod Archelaus, who was a terrible threat. Um, in fact, historically we know, Archelaus ended up being responsible for repeated massacres of Jews and was removed by Augustus in 6 AD and exiled to Vienna uh, because of his incompetence and his brutality. So Joseph, Joseph's estimation of him was proved right by history. Uh, now, I know <laughs> the differences between Luke and Matthew are the kinds of details that drive fundamentalists to an easy grave. We Catholics, we're not supposed to be fundamentalists. If we force Matthew's gospel to accept the Lucan narrative, we miss out on what Matthew's gospel is saying about the person of Joseph, which is different than what Luke implied. In this gospel of Matthew, Joseph, not only took a pregnant woman with a child not his own as his wife, not only goes into exile in another country for the sake of that child, but also leaves his home in Bethlehem permanently and goes to Nazareth to safeguard that baby. Uh, Joseph was more than a, a, a righteous man. He was also an utterly selflessly good one. Things to notice. In this gospel, in Matthew's gospel, uh, the, the narrator shows us the events of chapters one and two through Joseph's eyes. His genealogy is bestowed on Jesus. He discovers that Mary is pregnant. 
he is addressed by an angel to encourage him to take Mary as his wife. There's a brief break from Joseph's point of view through the episode of the Magi, but it returns to Joseph again. He is again warned in a dream and takes his family and flees to Egypt. He brings his family back from Egypt, but not to his home in Bethlehem of Judea. He resettles in the relative safety of Nazareth and Galilee, where Archelaus' much more competent brother and uh, Antipas was tetrarch. Although we see most things in these two chapters through Joseph's eyes, he never speaks once. We never hear his inner dialogue. Everything we know about him is revealed to us through his actions. He is the embodiment of the maxim. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Joseph is a quiet hero who doesn't even use any energy to be self-effacing. He simply acts for the good of others and in silence. If you look at Jesus' teaching in this gospel, Matthew's gospel, which we hear every year on Ash Wednesday in, uh, from Matthew 6, uh, about not performing deeds to be seen, about not blowing trumpets when we give alms, about praying in secret, about fasting in a way unobservable, we can certainly guess that Joseph's quiet dignity and goodness was a model for jo Jesus' encouragement to us. And then and then and then, Joseph quietly disappears from Matthew's gospel, at least as an active character. He's going to be mentioned in passing, not by name, only once more when Jesus returns to Nazareth. He passes as quietly as he operated without a word. This gospel isn't about him. He isn't about him. This gospel is about his stepson, and he too is about his stepson. Uh, Teresa, did we have any questions come up? Oh, we have one question. Um, what do we know about Mary's genealogy? Oh, nothing factual. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about uh, an, an, an early second century Christian writing, the Protoevangelium of James, which suggests late that Mary was also a descendant of the house of David. But there's nothing in either Matthew nor Luke's gospel to give us any indication who uh, sh uh, she had as forebearers. So uh, sometimes we just have to admit we don't know. And there's one of them. Okay. Uh, again, if you have questions, if you put them in the chat, uh, Teresa will be looking at them and I'll uh, try to answer them as we go along. So back to. Matthew's gospel, but jumping all the way to chapter 13, verse 54, and we don't have much here, but it, there are little indications hidden in it. Matthew 13, 54, he came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogues. This is Jesus. They were astonished and said, where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother named Mary and his brother James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not his sisters all with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. So now going back again a little bit to the Greek, the tenses of the verbs suggest that Mary is still alive as she is at that very moment in the present tense being called Mary. Uh, it's implied that Jesus had living siblings also. And isn't that a can of worms? We'll get back to that. And that the carpenter, whose son Jesus is, is probably dead at this point in the narrative. His name is not given. Isn't he, is not he not the son of the carpenter whose name is not given? So the carpenter apparently is dead. This identity and existence of those siblings was a question as far back as the second century, when a non-canonical infancy gospel, meaning not included in the Bible, but called the Protoevangelium of James, which I just mentioned earlier in the answer to your question, suggested uh, that Joseph was an older man and that he was a widower. So the, this is from the Protoevangelium of James, that Joseph was an older man, that he was a widower, that he still had living children from his deceased wife, that Mary was his second wife, and that these children, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and the sisters were Jesus' stepbrothers and stepsisters from Joseph's uh, uh, deceased first wife. And that finally, that because Jesus was, excuse me, that Joseph was older, he may well have died bef uh, long before Mary, who would likely have been between 14 and 16 when she married him. It's an intriguing suggestion. And we can't prove that the Protoevangelium of James is true. It would also perhaps explain the aged Joseph's willingness to maintain continence with Mary. 
it's, uh, it's also is at the root of much art, like the picture here that uh, where Joseph is painted as a white haired older man. This Prote Evangelium of James does, does contain some details that we know to be inaccurate. That doesn't mean it's inaccurate in every detail. It is, by the way, where the traditional names of Joseph's, uh, excuse me, of, uh, Aunt, of Mary's parents, St. Joachim and St. Anne, are derived. Uh, we, they are in our calendar, uh, but they come from the Prote Evangelium of James. So here we have Joseph the carpenter. Uh, here we have his vocation. He is a tectone, a carpenter, a woodworker, a builder. Um, in Mark 6, 3, Mark, uh, Mark's gospel, at that moment in the synagogue, they say about Jesus, is he not the carpenter referring to Jesus? In this parallel passage in Matthew that we just read from 1355, it, it go, the gospel steps back from that making Joseph the carpenter rather than Jesus. In Luke 4.22, in that parallel passage, it steps even further back, not mentioning carpentry at all. And it's, and it's probably a question of social status. Mark makes Jesus a carpenter, a, a worker with his hands. Mark himself is probably a peasant, and he has a very simple uh, uh, gospel that, uh, that demonstrates that he doesn't have any formal education. Matthew, who has a better education, uh, will make Joseph the carpenter and leave Joseph and Jesus out of it. Luke, uh, who may or may not be very comfortable with Jesus being a woodworker, but is very uncomfortable with sharing this detail with Theophilus. If you remember from the beginning of Luke's gospel, he's writing for Theophilus, your excellency, who probably wouldn't have been able to take Jesus seriously if either he or his father was a carpenter. But the evidence is here for us. Joseph worked with his hands. So Jesus was, uh, so Jesus chose, excuse me, a man who worked with his hands for his foster father. Being a member of the kinds of classes that lived hand to mouth in the subsistence manner it makes his generous Joseph's generous response to the flight of, from Herod all the more heroic. If he had any savings, which often subsistence people who worked with their hands did not, he would have expended them to get to and from Egypt. So we're invited to uh, we're invited to adopt Jesus Christ's acceptance of a common laborer as his dad as a starting point for our evaluation of those who build our buildings, but also those who pick our crops in the fields. Those who serve us in restaurants or work in the kitchens, those who stand behind the counters in stores, those who fix our cars and our plumbing, those who work in factories, those who cut our hair, the ones who do our gardening, the mechanics who fix our cars, the people, people who pick up trash and recycling. Joseph was such a man. And his dignity is unassailable. Joseph the worker. That's the family Jesus chose for himself. So switching to Luke, uh, we read also in the infancy narrative, this time Luke's, so you can move to the gospel of Luke chapter one, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin be to a, uh, uh, betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to, coming to her, he said, Hail, favor one, the Lord is with you. So here we have a second verification of Matthew's point that Joseph was of the lineage of David. Notice, though, that the point of view, the perspective in Luke is through Mary's experience, not Joseph's. As in Matthew, Joseph will not speak, though he does act. And we, we will never enter into his, uh, into his inner experience of these events in Luke. So in Luke 2, Chapter one, in those days, and here we have it, the story that we are most familiar with, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled, this for tax purposes. This was the first enrollment while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be enrolled, each to his own town, and Joseph, here is the man of action, too, went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, that is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Uh, the word for betrothed as opposed to married is in fact used here. 
but the fact that they're traveling together makes her his wife. So the use of the verb for betrothal here is simply to express the newness of the relationship. What's missing in, uh, in Luke is Joseph's reaction to the pregnancy. Joseph will know that he had nothing to do with his pregnancy in Luke's gospel. It's an interesting puzzle to me that Luke does nothing at all to address Joseph's reaction to it. Perhaps the implication is that if Mary said that the Holy Spirit had overshadowed her, he simply believed her, which again is completely extraordinary. Now, he, here he is going to David's city, uh, and a lot of people would consider Jerusalem David's city, but the home of Jesse, David's father, and David's home growing up, and the place from which he was chosen and anointed by the prophet is Bethlehem, a place that became the object of prophecy some 500 plus years later after David, who was alive in 1000 BC, when the prophet Malachi says in chapter five, verse one, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, least among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. So here we have Malachi predicting that Jesus is coming from Bethlehem, but his origins are uh, much older. Uh, here, Matthew and Luke's gospels both attest to this. So Joseph proves himself here to be a law-abiding citizen of the Roman Empire who registers for taxes according to the law, uh, which may well have been an important question. Uh, Luke's gospel and, Mar and Matthew's are written after the Jewish, there was a big Jewish rebellion in the late 60s of the first century. And there was a general question in the Roman Empire of just about how moral, how law-abiding Jews were. And uh, Luke makes it very clear that Joseph is a law-abiding man. This story with the journey of Joseph and Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem informs most of our Christmas consciousness. We've got our nativity scenes at home uh, and we've got a journey on the donkey with no room at the inn, with the baby Jesus laying in a manger, with the angels singing, with the coming of shepherds. This is the story that informs our consciousness. Matthew's story in which the baby Jesus was born in Joseph's home in Bethlehem is almost unknown by, uh, by everyone, although it's right there in Matthew's gospel. Uh, I do not know whether either Matthew or Luke is historical, yet they do coincide in, in some critical details. Uh, whether he grows up of Nazareth because it's Joseph's home, Gospel of Luke, or because Joseph is trying to get away from Herod Archelaus, Gospel of Matthew, the fact remains that both Gospels concur on Jesus' place of birth, Bethlehem, and his place of rearing, Nazareth. In either case, Joseph is the key figure in determining these details. How are we doing for questions, Teresa? We have a few. Okay. Is 14 a symbolic number? Uh, you know, it's kind of something that the uh, genealogy writers were stuck with. <laughs> um, when Matthew composed his genealogy, he actually went to the Book of Kings and Chronicles and took the names right out of there. And they just happened to be up through David, tw uh, 28 generations. He divided it in two and then created another 14 for Joseph and Jesus. So that is a historical thing taken right out of Kings and Chronicles. So no, <laughs> uh, but, 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 uh, Matthew found it intriguing. Yes, yes. Uh, back in Matthew, so are you saying that Joseph and Mary both lived in Bethlehem? And if yes. were they, is that where they were betrothed? Yes. Okay. In, okay. in Matthew's gospel. Right. The, so, so hear me out on this. In the narrative world, every book, every, uh, every literature that is a narrative creates its own little narrative world. And when you're in that world, that's the world you're operating in. If, if you read The Hobbit, uh, there are little people who live in The Hobbit. You know, there are dwarves or elves. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you're reading the Chronicles of Narnia, there are all kinds of fantastic things. While you're in someone's narrative world, what's true is what the narrator, narrator says. So in Matthew's gospel, Joseph and Mary lived in Bethlehem. In Luke's gospel, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth. Okay, so two narrative worlds. These are not histories. Right, right. Uh, could Matthew have known Joseph? No, no. Uh, uh, Matthew is writing late enough that we, we doubt we doubt that he knew Jesus. <laughs> no. And the last one here, uh, was Mary required to travel with Joseph for the census? 
Uh, all we know is what the text says. And when you are a humble man, and Jesus, uh, Joseph was a humble man, you have no one to take care of your family. You've got to keep your family with you. So it was very likely simply practicality that required him to do that. Now, we are unaware of any command from Caesar Augustus or from Quirinius requ requiring people to go back to their hometowns. We're unaware of it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. We are aware of uh, that kind of taxation in Egypt, not too far away, where in Egypt, people were required to go back to their gnomes, that's N-O-M-E-S, their, their places of origin. Uh, so it, it does happen elsewhere and not too far away. Um, but all we know about this taxation is what uh, Luke's gospel tells us. Okay. Any other questions? That's it. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to look um, at Luke's genealogy. There we go. Uh, uh, not long. Uh, Luke's gospel, like Matthew's, contains the genealogy of Joseph's ancestors. Uh, although it works in opposite directions. Matthew starts with Abraham and then moves forward through history towards Joseph. Luke starts with Joseph and then moves backwards to Adam. Uh, it is irreconcilable with Matthew's between David and Jesus. Before David, they are the same. But uh, Luke traces Joseph's lineage through David's son, Nathan, where Matthew traced it through David's son, Solomon, the son of Bathsheba, the wife heretofore of Uriah the Hittite. So the gospel, they, they are irreconcilable after David. And I'm unable to discern if either has any historical value, but the point isn't to do history. Both clarify that Joseph was not the blood father of Joseph, even as they bestow Joseph's lineage on Jesus granting him David as his ancestor. And, and through this, allowing him to pick up the mantle of Messiah. So in Luke chapter three, verse 23, <laughs> Luke, uh, Luke is gonna say Jesus was the son as was thought of Joseph. So he's gonna, he's gonna step back from uh, uh, the actual begetting thing here. Jesus was the son as was thought of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matthew, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Naam, the son of Elsie, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthias, the son of Semain, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Joanan, the son of Reza, the son of Jerubabel, the son of Shiltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of El Madam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Mat Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. None of those names are in Matthew's version until you get to David. The genealogy continues parallels to, uh, parallel to math, Matthew's beginning here because they both were able to draw on one and two Kings and one and two Chronicles. All right, verse 32, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashton, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, and here is where Matthew started. Um, uh, so uh, in Matthew's gospel, the interest was in Jesus' Jewish and Israelite uh, roots because Matthew's gospel is, has a very strong Jewish consciousness and, and Matthew's community was probably largely made up of Jewish Christians. Luke is a Gentile writing to Gentiles. And so he doesn't stop at Abraham. He wants to connect Jesus to all of humanity, not just the Israelites. So Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So what Luke does, through our shared descendant from Adam, we're all kins, we're all kinfolk of Jesus. Through Joseph. So uh, uh, Luke needs to uh, include room for all of us who are the descendants of Gentiles. 
Luke 2.22, presentation in the temple. When the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons in accordance with the dictates of the law of the Lord. Here we have it again. Joseph is observing the law, this time not the the law of the empire, but the law as found in Torah, specifically Leviticus 12.6. And it's noteworthy here that the offering was not the yearling lamb with a pigeon or turtle doves, but simply two turtle doves, the offering expressly allowed for the poor. That's uh, the social class that Joseph is in, that uh, Jesus is born into. There's no surprise in this because the laborer might well be bankrupted by the birth of his sons, but Joseph was not a wealthy man to begin with. And he, so he could not have uh, provided a lamb. So uh, there was a very small middle class. That's what, what's very different about their world and ours, a very, very small. It might have been as big as 5% of the populace. There's the 1% that ruled the 5% middle class, which included the clergy and the uh, upper uh, military and some very well-to-do landowners. And then there was the 95% hoi, Poloi, you've heard that phrase, hoi poloi, in Greek means the many, the 95 percenters, all right? That's where Jesus belongs. Uh, Joseph was not a wealthy man. He was chosen by jo Jesus, perhaps not in spite of this, but because of it. Jesus belongs to humanity, to hoi poloi, to the many, not the powerful. Choosing Joseph clarifies this. So between Luke 2.25 and 32, Joseph and Mary encounter Simeon in the temple who refers to Jesus as the light for the revelation to the Gentiles. There you have it again. And the glory for your people Israel. The text continues in verse 33. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said of him. So Gabriel's annunciation didn't entirely prepare Joseph and Mary for Jesus' reception. He's just a baby, yet others are struck by him. Their amazement suggests that Gabriel's message hadn't entirely sunk in. So back to verse 39, when they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So when someone starts off begotten by the Holy Spirit, one can expect something notable, something special, uh, but don't pass by, don't let it pass by, if Jesus is human like us in all things but sin, that he still needed to learn, as we're going to see in the, the very next passage, and that his teacher in the ways of becoming a man and a carpenter is Joseph. So if Jesus, in fact, becomes strong and filled with wisdom, and we have every reason to believe from the rest of the Gospels that that was true, that Joseph played a part in this. So uh, the, the great story of Joseph and Jesus, and when Jesus is in the temple, verse 41, each year his family went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Again, we observe that Joseph's family is law abiding, observing the commandments, including those that required long and expensive journeys to Jerusalem. So each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover when Jesus was 12 years old, and they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. So you may be thinking, how could they not have known? <laughs> um, all right. Health conditions in the ancient world were atrocious, and lifespans were very short, and so was that portion of a woman's life when she was actually fertile. By the time women were in their 20s, they were all already multiply beset by parasites and pregnancies became more and more at risk. So you began to have babies as soon as you could. So you married as soon as you could. So it was necessary for young people to marry and have children as they were able. As a result, the transition from childhood to adulthood was a lot shorter than it is in our world. Jesus at 12 years of age stood right there at that very liminal moment between the life of a child under the care of his mother and the life of a man under the care of his stepfather. Uh, uh, we see this, there's an incongruous moment in the modern world where a 13 year old boy reads from the Torah 
and proclaims at his bar mitzvah at 13, now I am a man. Uh, up until all too recently, this would have been considered true. So that being the case, he's right there on that bridge between being a child under his mother's care and being a young man under his father's. Uh, right there at 12, while they're traveling back to Nazareth in Galilee in the caravan, Mary, traveling with the women and the children in the center of the caravan, dwelt almost certainly wistfully under the impression that she had lost Jesus to the care of Joseph, his father. Joseph, on his part, traveling with the men either at the front or the rear of the caravan, was thinking that Jesus, the boy, was still with his mother. It was only at the point later in the day when they rejoined that they find out the truth, that he wasn't with either of them. Uh, verse 44, thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him for, uh, among their relatives and acquaintances, but not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. So a day out and a day back, they're both wrecks at this point. Do 12-year-old boys know how dangerous the world is? Of course not. We do everything we can to safeguard them from how dangerous the world is. We don't want them to live in nothing but utter fear. So after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers and listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at this, at, excuse me, at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. Okay, do you notice that still at this moment, Joseph is silent. In his mind, Jesus is still in his mother's care. It's for her to discipline him. Mary sees this too and calls him not son, if you're reading the NAB revised, which says son, but child or technon, as opposed to neoniskos, young man. She doesn't call him young man. She calls him child. Um, child, why have you done this to us? Now, the word translated as with great anxiety has the sense in Greek of tormented and in great pain. Mary speaks for Joseph at this moment, revealing his inner life and care for his foster son and her own. Jesus says to them, verse 49, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. They didn't understand because Jesus had been taken entirely into Joseph's heart. And as happens in adoptive families, had simply become the adopted father's son. So back in verse 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. So in case there was any doubt about Jesus and Joseph, it's expressly clear that he was subject to them. Who put a out toys. Dative plural, plural, he was, uh, he was subject to them. Uh, what we see here is the adv adventurous establishment of his own identity uh, here in this 12-year-old uh, <laughs> uh, escapade in the temple on Jesus' part. Uh, here's Jesus, human like us in all things, doesn't quite catch on to Joseph and Mary's distress. He's genuinely puzzled. Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I must be about such and such? He's 12 and was a usually obedient child, as we heard. Um, he thought he was doing the right thing. <laughs> he doesn't know how petrified a parent can be. Anyway, uh, more, uh, Joseph again says nothing. He's spoken for by Mary, who still has Jesus' care. Uh, but, but I'm sure that she got to representing Joseph's true feelings. So here we are. Um, uh, th this is the last passage that says something of substance about Joseph, other than simply to say that, Je uh, that Jesus was his son. Um, and again, he is silent. But again, <laughs> he almost certainly had to pay for his participation in that uh, caravan, which he abandons to go get this boy who is doing a 12-year-old adolescent thing, thinking he's doing the right things, and is silent. He does not beat, should we say, the bejesus out of Jesus um, for what he does. He allows Mary, the mother, to take care of this boy who needs, uh, who needs to learn, yeah, yeah, you scared us. You scared us in a big way because they loved him. All right. So 
Uh, any questions, Teresa? We have come to the end of this presentation, and so I uh, 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 will take the questions that are there. And if you have any questions to add, please do so right now. Go ahead, Teresa. We do. So was Joseph a man of faith before he was engaged to Mary? Now, one indication we have is that a narrator speaking about uh, Joseph as a, as, a, uh, as a righteous man. Uh, righteousness would have implied in the Jewish context a right relationship with God and a right relationship with the law and a right relationship with God's people. So, yeah. Uh, did Josephus chronicle the slaughter by Herod? He did not. He did not. Uh, uh, Bethlehem was far enough out of the way that if this happened, if this was in fact a historical thing, uh, it did not reach his notice. Uh, uh, but Josephus was cr not chronicling the affairs of small people. Josephus chronicled the affairs of big people and how they interrelated with one another. So uh, this wouldn't this wouldn't have reached his notice in any case. If men were to marry at a young age, would it have been considered strange that Jesus remained unmarried into his 30s? It was absolutely strange that Jesus remained uh, unmarried. Yes, it was. Uh, okay, and how was Jesus not going with his parents, not a sin? <laughs> because he meant well. He's 12 years old. <laughs> he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. Uh, you know, uh, they, they visit the temple. You know, he uh, has a chance on that last day to get back to the temple. He, he had good experiences with the people there. Uh, he starts talking. You know, things get carried away. The caravan leaves. Uh, he's preoccupied. He's having this great time. Uh, someone, uh, when, he, when Joseph and Mary don't show up, this precocious child gets someone to take care of him for these days. Uh, and apparently he's doing just fine. One of the things that all of the gospels will portray was that Jesus was incredibly charismatic. That should not surprise us. He was gifted right from the very start. And here were these people completely taken in by this kid and his parents don't show up. So someone takes him home uh, uh, for two nights before Joseph and Mary uh, get back to find him. And they bring him right back to the temple where Joseph and Mary have a chance of finding him. Um, but he thinks he's doing something good and he's getting all kinds of affirmation from the people that he's talking to. He's 12 years old. Was he wrong? Yes. Was he sinful? No, he was 12. Okay. So Jesus must have known the pain he would cause his mother because of his divine nature. Uh -huh. When does his divine nature intersect with his human nature? All right. Uh, like us in all things, all things, but said. We learned that in Hebrews. It gets quoted in our fourth Eucharistic prayer, but that comes out of the, the epistle to the Hebrews. If, if to be like us in all things means he's got to learn. He's got to figure things out. He was not an infant in Mary's arms suckling while thinking thoughts of atomic uh, fission or uh, a, a, a spatial uh, string theory or whatever. Uh, he was a baby. He was hungry. He made messes down south and it felt uncomfortable and he cried. Uh, he, he was not born speaking. He had to learn to speak. At some uh, appropriate moment, uh, while crawling on the ground, he uh, took a handful of dirt and did with it what he did with everything else. He put it in his mouth uh, to Mary's great consternation. He was a baby. He was a little boy. He was an adolescent. He was a young man. And he did all of those things in turn. At some point, he has a, a aha moment, and the gospel seemed to suggest that it was at his baptism, when the heavens are opened up, and the voice speaks to him in Mark's gospel and says, you are my beloved son. You've always known that there was something special between us, and yes, the answer is true. You are my beloved son, and you've been wondering, are we, are we on good terms? Yes, uh, uh, I'm well pleased with you. That was a conversation that the heavenly voice speaks with Jesus to affirm this thing that has been growing in his life all the way through. So when does he, when does he come into his fullness? Uh, the gospel suggests at the baptism. We have um, uh, a comment here, uh, confusion on the exile to, to Egypt. Yes. Luke does not mention it. it at all. Was Okay. So it, do we know if it was after Jesus's presentation in the temple? Okay. 
What we have here are two narrative worlds that are not the same. Um, uh, a little off topic. Matthew was writing to a Jewish community and Jews had an epic, magnificent, incredible figure, Moses. And Moses uh, duked it out with Pharaoh and, and, and Moses brought down all kinds of plagues and Moses led the people through waters uh, piled to the left and the right and led them through the desert and fought battles against kings and was victorious. Moses was this incredible figure. Who is greater, Moses or Jesus? Matthew has to drag his Jewish Christians into the confrontation between those two figures. And Matthew begins his gospel dragging Jesus and Moses into contact with each other by all kinds of things. And one of them is this uh, uh, Joseph dreaming dreams, ending up in Egypt. That's one of the things he does. Uh, one of the things he does is uh, Mo uh, Moses is, a, is credited with writing the five books of uh, Torah. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus will give five masterful homilies. Um, uh, and Matthew is pushing the point uh, the new and greater than Moses is Jesus. And so the Joseph story is probably not meant intended to be historical, but it is, it is intended to drag the Jewish Christian into this uh, consideration. Who is greater, Jesus or Joseph? And the very fact that we don't, that none of us would have any question about it, well, of course it's Jesus because he's God. But that we, they had to figure that out. They had to figure that out. And Matthew was trying to help them. And he used this as one of his multiple uh, uh, um, ruses uh, towards that end. Uh, the slaughter of the innocents, that takes right back to Moses also with the slaughter of the, of the kids. And uh, um, so uh, Matthew has the, one after another at the beginning of this gospel. If you go looking for them, you'll find them. Uh, one more question here. Is Luke making a theological point by including the story of Jesus in the temple in his gospel? Okay. Um, He's, he's doing all kinds of things. He is, in fact, giving us a great gift. He is dragging us right into an encounter with the humanity of Jesus. It has always, always, always been the tendency of Christianity to shove Jesus into heaven and to not take seriously the incarnation. And the incarnation was this huge revelation by God intended uh, uh, to let us, uh, to, to give us this window into what God is like by sending one, uh, not like us, but us, us. Jesus came as a human. And this story forces us to confront the childhood of Jesus that in fact, he had to learn. He had to figure out there were things that, that he could do uh, um, with all the good intentions in the world that would leave his, his parents frightened out of their wits that maybe he ought not do. You know, this is a learning thing for him. All right. So we encounter the humanity of Jesus. We encounter the lawfulness of Joseph and Mary. These, these are people who at great expense are obeying the law. And we get a glimmer that even early on, and this matters, Jesus knew that his relationship with, with the heavenly father was something special. And he kind of presumed that Mary and Joseph would understand it, and they didn't. So they didn't get it from them. He did not get it from them. This is something internal to him that he knew as a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. When do men know who they are? If I ask a group of women this, they say men never do. That's what they tell me. Um, uh, and I'd like to say we pass out of our adolescence. It used to be that we, we talked about adolescence as our, our, our teen years, <laughs> but now it apparently is heading right into the thirties. If you listen to some of the developmental things that they talk about now, but um, Jesus was precocious, and he had a sense of who he was very early on. It didn't come to full fruition, we think, until that baptism moment when he hears the Father verify this thing, this hunch, this growing hunch. That there was something going on between him and the Father. It was something special. And the uh, Father says, oh, yes, you're absolutely right. You are my beloved son. Okay. And that's, that's all the questions we have. Okay. All right. Uh, did anybody else have any questions? I'd be happy to uh, float any. Um, 
we, uh, we, we could fit. Oh, I, I, and, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I meant to share that, the, uh, the prayer. We could, we could pray together, but, but no, uh, let's just make sure that there aren't any questions and then we'll go back to the, the prayer. Any? Okay. Uh, either you're typing for furiously or we're, or we're done. So uh, I have a prayer, uh, which I, uh, we're going to share here. Let me just go on to it. And I'm going to ask you, pray along with me, but keep your uh, uh, yourself muted, because if we all try to pray together, it really comes out really kind of scrambled. Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, pray together. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to you, God entrusted his only son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ grew to be a man. Saint Joseph, to us too, show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen. 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 All right. Well, blessings to everyone. I hope I hope that this uh, uh, served you well. And uh, you know, I I just have nothing but the deepest love for Saint Joseph. And the, the more I study him, the more I love him. Um, and I hope you I hope you do too. And even though he is quiet, and even though he passes from the scriptures uh, very quickly, he does wonderful things. Okay. God bless. Brother Patrick. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>